turn there today, John chapter 12, to get ready. And I want you to be thinking about, just think in your head, what is the biggest sacrifice that you've ever made for someone? What is the biggest sacrifice? And who did you make that sacrifice for? What's the biggest sacrifice you've ever made and who did you make that sacrifice for? So when I think about sacrifice, I, I instantly go to my kids. And, and any parent can relate in this room. We sacrifice a lot for our kids, true? Yes. We sacrifice a lot for them. And so uh, I have four kids and one of them is an adult and he's out living on his own. Uh, and I'm proud of him. And I remember the day that I dropped him off uh, for college and I helped him unload his stuff. And you know, that's a big deal when, they, when, when you have your first one move out of the house. It's a big deal. And you know, some people ask me, you know, Jeremy, what was that like? What was that like when, when you had your first kid leave the house? Well, well, just imagine that you somehow found a baby alligator, right? And, and you brought that alligator back into your tub and you put it in the tub and, and you'd have people come over and you'd be like, look, look, look at our little baby alligator. Look, feel, put your hand inside and feel his little teeth, his little, little bitey, bitey teeth. Isn't that cute? Yeah. Uh, and, and then after, as time passes, you're like, man, we got to get this thing out of here. <laughs> like this thing's got to go, right? This thing, this thing's starting to get dangerous. Uh, it's kind of scary. Uh, it needs to go out and kill and eat other thing, other living creatures. Like just, just, you know, it needs to go, time to go. Uh, but I love being a dad. And I was there at the birth of my children, all of them. And, you know, birth is probably one of the most dramatic human experiences that, that, that you can go through, right? And, and have, you know, the babies, they just, have you ever noticed they just never stop coming? You know, they just keep coming to this world like fresh racks of donuts. Just, the babies just keep coming. And, and uh, you, you know why they're here, don't you? Like, have you ever stopped to think about why they're here? They are here to replace us. <laughs> that is their mission. You know, and if you think about it, their first words are mama, dad, dad, and bye-bye. <laughs> They're here to take us over. <laughs> like, they are here to replace us. That's what the babies are thinking. Oh, we'll see who's wearing the diapers when this is all over. That's, that's what the babies are thinking. Yeah. But again, the father struggling to keep pace. Moms who are here, listen, we, we fathers, we want to do what you want us to do. We cannot do it. <laughs> we, we want to aspire and achieve. We can't do it. We try. It, it just fails. The, the baby is born, and this wonderful thing happens with the mothers, the, the female. The, these instincts just kick in, right? These instincts kick in. And with the male, nothing. <laughs> nothing kicks in. We're just the same guy standing there that was there before. Like, we want, to do, we want to do. We cannot do it. We try. You know, and we sacrifice a lot, right? So, so we sacrifice a lot for these kids that, that we, we are trying to raise. We do a lot for them. And, you know, when I think about uh, people like Mother Teresa, who grew up very, very wealthy and left that very cushy lifestyle to go live in the poorest slums of India and live among them and left that life and sacrifice that lifestyle that she had. And I think about missionaries that go across the world and leave their families and they, and they go across the world and, and try to share Jesus with people. And some of them even get killed because they're in areas they don't, they don't want to hear about Jesus. But they do that. They sacrifice those things. And I think about why? Why do they do that? Well, for the same reason we sacrifice for our kids. What's that one word that I'm thinking about? You know what it is. It starts with an L. Love right we sacrifice because we love our children and these people that, that pick up and sacrifice and do big life changes for God they do it for love as well it's because they're so grateful for that grace that we sang about earlier that grace and that love that he gives us even though we don't deserve it and they, they see that Jesus died for our sins on the cross and he took our punishment it should have been ours and we go man why would he do that well he obviously loved us and so now I want to I want to repay him with my life. I want to show my gratitude by living for him, by sacrificing for him. And so I'm just warning you, Jesus. You know, we 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 kind of read all the the nice passages about who Jesus is and what a cool guy he is and how awesome he is. And he he was amazing. He is amazing. Um, but now we're getting into kind of the harder teachings of Jesus of what it means to be a disciple. You remember what disciple means? What's the a word that that is uh, disciple means that we, our modern day word. 
apprentice, right? Apprentice. So as we learn to be apprentices, sometimes Jesus asks us to do difficult things. How many of you know that's true this morning? Yes. He asks us to do difficult things. It's not going to be a cakewalk following Jesus. Yes. And, and I, 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 you know, so we're going through the book of John, John 12, verse 20. And I want you to think about the answer to these questions um, as we go throughout. Okay, so first of all, the kernel of wheat, when, G when Jesus says the hour has come, he's referring to it's time for him to go to the cross. Okay, that's what he means when he says the hour has come. He's going to the cross. What is Jesus' point in saying a kernel must die in order to multiply? I want you to be thinking about that as we read. Why does he say that in order for a, a kernel must die in order to multiply? And then I want you to look for what term does Jesus use in this passage to describe his followers? What term does he use? And what does Jesus expect of his followers from these verses? What does Jesus expect? And that's really where we're, where we're driving to, we're getting at. What does Jesus expect for us? So that's what we're going to look for. John 12, verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What is he talking about? It's time to go to the cross. Death, burial, resurrection. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. What term does Jesus use for his followers? Servant. servant. My servant. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. So, kernel of wheat, I believe the kernel of wheat is about Jesus and about us. Now, the first part, that might have been obvious to some of you. Oh, of course, Jesus is talking when he says a kernel of wheat must die and the single seed will multiply. Of course, he's talking about his death on the cross and how his death uh, will produce many followers and, and build a kingdom, right? One death will lead to many uh, coming into God's kingdom, right? That part was probably obvious, but I believe he's also talking about us, that if we will die to ourselves, we will then produce many followers and multiply ourselves as disciples yeah. jesus is willing to give up his life for the father and he expects his servants to do the same um, notice the kind of leader jesus is uh, a lot of leaders lead by intimidation intimidation factor but jesus leads by example he says look i'm willing to serve god unto the death and you can do this too right he's trying to encourage us through his life through his example. Jesus is talking about dying to self and living for him. Dying to self and living for him. Following Jesus means pledging our lives to him. That we are now uh, going to serve a new master, not ourselves anymore, but now we make Jesus the master of our lives. We talked about that a few weeks ago. New master, a new mindset, and then finally a new purpose pointing people to Jesus. So we've all already covered new master uh, two or three weeks ago. He's our master. Now let's talk about a new mindset and a new purpose. What is our new mindset? Die to self. Die to self. That's the new mindset. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, in the New Testament. And if you have one of our church Bibles, it is... Page 920. 920. Um, so check this out, this new mindset of dying to self. Paul uh, wrote about this in a couple of places. Paul had the mindset. He, he was there. Listen to what he said in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 
Get that. He says, I no longer live. That person, when I crossed that line and started following Jesus, that old person is dead. He's dead and gone. Now I'm just Christ in me. And I'm just a vessel. I'm just, you know, Jesus, whatever you need to do through me, I'm your vessel. Amen. That's, that was Paul's mindset. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15, he says, For Christ's love compels us, for we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, why? So that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Amen. So who do we live for now? Who died for us and was raised again? Jesus. Say it with confidence. Jesus. Jesus. We no longer live for ourselves, but we live for him who died and was raised again. That's the new mindset. Die to self. Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. In other words, in light of everything God has done for you to bring you salvation, Jesus humbling himself and coming to the earth and sacrificing his way of life up in heaven to become a baby and, and to bring us salvation in view of everything God's done, in view of God's mercy. Offer your bodies as what? Living sacrifices. Living sacrifices. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And then he says how we can be living sacrifice. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't be like the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What are we talking about? A new mindset today. Die to self. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Living sacrifices. What in the world does that mean? It sounds like a contradiction of terms, doesn't it? A sacrifice. When, when you put something on the altar and you sacrificed it, guess what happened to it? It died. It was dead. So what does, what does the Bible mean? What does God mean when he says be a living sacrifice? How do you be a living sacrifice? Sacrifices are dead. Well, he's talking about putting ourselves on the altar every day and dying to self and living for him. When, when you give your life to Christ, you're pledging your service. You're pledging to a life of sacrifice. Very much like a soldier when they enlist into the military. You know, it's, it's someone saying, okay, I understand that now I take orders from someone else. And if they tell me I need to move from here to there, what does a soldier say? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I do it without question, right? I, I'm here to do whatever you want me to do. That's what following Jesus is about. And, and a soldier also realizes that by enlisting themselves in the military, they take a chance that they might die in service, don't they? They're taking that risk, and they know that risk. And, and we take that risk as well. Um, many Christians have died for their faith. Uh, it not, not necessarily might not happen, but it, but it might. We need to be ready for that. Revelation 2.10 said, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Uh, Alexander the Great, pretty famous person, uh, he, he was going up to a certain city that was very strong, fortified, walled city, and he just had a small band of fighting men with him. Not, not a very large army, just a small band. And he goes up to the wall of this city, and he demands to see the king. And so they bring the king, the king comes to the wall, and he sees Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great says, I want you and all of your town to surrender to me today, right now. And the king looks down and he sees this small band of fighting men and he laughs. He's like, we're not surrendering to you. Are you kidding me? Uh, and so <clears throat> Alexander says, let me offer a demonstration. And so he lines all the soldiers up, single file line, and he has them march. And he marches them towards a sheer cliff. And one by one, these soldiers step off the cliff to their death one after another after another until 10 soldiers have walked off this cliff to their death and then he tells them stop and he brings them back to the king and he says i want you to surrender and they did you know why because they saw that those following him were committed to the death even to do whatever and they knew that they would not never stop until this city was conquered and so they, you have your surrender. Man, what could we do? What kind of impact could we make if we had that level of commitment for Jesus? 
Like, I'm willing to serve you even to the death if that's what it takes. But, but whatever it takes, whatever you call me to do, God, I will do it. And we could, we could take over the world. We, we could spread God's kingdom all over and make an impact in Reynoldsburg and all the surrounding areas with that level of commitment. And so we have a new mindset, dying to self. And then we also have another new mindset, living for Jesus every day. Living for Jesus every day. So this is what a lot of people, their mindset when it comes to being a Christian is. So a lot of people, um, we compartmentalize our, our Christian life, our life and what that looks like. And we say, okay, um, this, this is going to be my, my work life. This is my pitiful drawing of a computer laptop. Um, this is my work life, and, and I keep my work life in that compartment. And uh, this is my family life, and I keep that in its own separate compartment. And then I have my financial life and, and what I do there. And then I have my church life. You know, I go to church on what day? Sunday. Sunday. I go to church on Sunday. That's where my spiritual life happens is on Sunday in this box. A Sunday morning, you know, and we have all these compartments, right? Let me tell you what actually is our situation. All of our life is our spiritual life. Amen. And inside of that, inside of that is our work. Our work is part of our spiritual life. Our family is what? Part of our spiritual life. Our finances, guess what? Are part of our finance, our, our spiritual life. All of our life is our spiritual life. And all of these pieces fit into that. That is our new mindset that we need to take on. We need to take this mindset and blow it up. Blow it up with a grenade. Um, this this mentality where we just we just live for Jesus one day a week, it needs to be blown to pieces. Every single day we die to self. And we live for Jesus every single day of our lives. Amen. Come on. New mindset. It's a different mindset, isn't it? Yeah. We're having to rewire and reprogram some things this morning. God, please help us reprogram this morning. Let, let your Holy Spirit do his work and reprogram our minds right now to take on this new way of thinking. It's a new mindset. New master, Jesus. Not me anymore. I'm not the master anymore. Jesus is my master. Number two, new mindset. Number three, new purpose. And what is our purpose? To use every part of our lives to point people to Jesus. That's our new purpose. Titus. We're going to Titus, y'all. <laughs> Titus. So Titus, still in the New Testament. Chapter 2, verse 9. is page 966 in our church Bibles. It's the... The last scripture we'll read this morning, Titus, it's a new purpose. And our purpose is to use every part of our lives to point people to Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 9. Now, I understand we don't really have slavery. We're going to read about slaves uh, here. It's telling slaves how to live as Christians. We're going to take the modern day equivalent of work. Okay, just, just read boss to, you know, boss to employee uh, relationship here. Teach slaves, teach employees to be subject to their masters and everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that, here's the key, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Amen. Did you catch that? The way we live, the way we conduct ourselves in our jobs, is supposed to, the goal is to make the teaching of God our Savior attractive. That it makes, it, people see our lives and they say, man, I want what they have. I want to be like that. I don't know what you've got, but you got something special and I want that. And so we use every part of our lives to point people to Jesus. We use our jobs. That's the first area that we use, is our jobs to point people to Jesus. So whether that's Donato's or... Uh, the military or uh, what other jobs we got represented Walmart um, you know in our uh, uh, delivering food to others um, whatever we do use our job there was a Christian barber 
who uh, was really convicted by a message that he needed to do more to try to witness to people better. And so he woke up one morning and he said, all right, God, this morning, I, I'm no more playing around. I'm going to witness to the very first customer who walks through my door, a barber. And so the first customer comes in uh, and he said, and the guy says, excuse me, I would like to get a shave today. Can I get a shave? He says, sure. Here, have a seat here and, uh, and I'll be right back. So the barber goes in the back room and he says a prayer and he goes, God, I told you I was going to witness to my first customer today. He's here. Please give me just the right words uh, so that I can witness to this customer. And so the barber comes out and he has a razor blade in one hand. And he has a Bible in the other and he says, excuse me, sir, I'd like to ask you a question. Are you ready to die? <laughs> that's, that's probably not the best approach. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a fair question. <laughs> Probably not with the razor blade. So, um, you know, uh, I, I just loved watching Tim Tebow play football. Some of you remember watching him play for the Florida Gators. And uh, uh, he, he was amazing at how he was so bold with his faith, right? He, he did not shy away at all from showing that he was a Christian. Remember, he would put the Bible verses in the little black, whatever you call that stuff that you put right there. Yeah. It would be John 3.16 or, or Philippians 4.13 or some. He would always have some scripture. He was not shy to let people know he was a believer in Jesus. I read a story recently about this football coach who uh, would try to lead people to Jesus. And um, he, uh, he was baptizing his football players. And he was doing prayers with his football players. And all of a sudden the school comes in and says, hey, you can't do that anymore. Um, you are forbidden from baptizing people. You're forbidden from praying from praying with your players from now on. He said, okay, I'll just teach my players how to baptize people and how to pray with people. And so he did, and he trained them. He said, here, go go baptize, go lead people to Christ, go pray with them. Uh, and he wasn't gonna let that stop him. I had a coach uh, when I was in junior high, me and my best friend Andy were uh, managers for the baseball team. And, and what, what a manager is, is a churched up word for lugging all the equipment around. I don't know why they call it manager. Like, what? That's not what you're doing. You're not managing anything. You're carrying equipment. So we were the managers of the baseball team for the high school. And we would ride around with the coach. We would load stuff in his, uh, he has some kind of SUV. We load in the back and we would go for rides. Our, our practice field was in a different place from the school. So we would ride with him to the practice field. And Coach Cleefish, would always talk to us about different things. And I remember one day he asked us, he said, uh, hey, I just wanna ask you guys, are, are you, uh, do you go to church anywhere? Or are you believers in Jesus? And uh, I said, we said, yeah, we, we actually both go to the same church. We, and we're believers, we're Christians, you know? He's like, okay, good. And, and so there's, there's a, a coach from school using his platform. You know, he was doing it after school, uh, you know, in, in his way, whatever way we find a way to point people to Jesus. Um, one day in our church, at our church in Mississippi, uh, this school bus broke down in our church parking lot. And I noticed on the school bus, it said John Wade Karate. And uh, I, I went out there and I said, hey, what do you guys need? You need help, you need a phone, you need water, you know, what do you need? And I started to get to know this guy, uh, John Wade. And he was telling me how he's a, a Christian and he opened a karate dojo for the purpose of teaching kids about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he said that uh, every person who enlists in this karate dojo, uh, he tells them right up front that we're gonna have daily devotions with your kids. And are you okay with that? They have to sign off that they're okay that, with the fact that he's gonna teach them about Jesus. And I thought that was really cool. And I said, so how, you know, how's that going? Is it like, are you, are you making good money? Are you making, doing okay with it? He said, I, honestly, kind of struggling. You see our bus broken down, um, you know, but, but we're making it, we're paying our bills and we're leading people to Jesus. And that's all that matters. Um, so people using their job to point people to Jesus. That's what we're talking about. And so one of your next steps is how could you use your job to point people to Jesus? Your next step says, Brainstorm ways you can use your job or school to point people to Jesus. If you're, if you're not working yet, if you're a student, how can you use your school to point people to Jesus? Some of you will want to do that and brainstorm those ways today. So we use our job 
to lead people, point people to Jesus. Every part of our lives, our job, our marriage should point people to Jesus. Our parenting, your life is not your own. My life is not my own. We use all these parts for his glory, all the parts of our lives. Your house is not your own. Your house is actually the Lord's house. We need to use it as the Lord's house. Um, and I was so proud of one of the elders of this church in Mississippi when we had a situation, this 18 year old kid who had been worshiping in our church, he was 17, and then he turned 18. And as soon as he turned 18, the day he turned 18, his mother said to him, I'm no longer responsible for you. You have to find somewhere else to live. And so that day he was homeless and he's a member of our church. And so I went to the elders. I said, what are we gonna do? He's literally homeless. Um, and that elder said, you know what? I'm willing to use my house to put him up. Uh, is anyone else willing to use their house? And, and through a team effort, we took turns. He stayed at one of our houses a week at a time. He would stay at, you know, the Baruli's house. That was the first one to volunteer. And then our house and then another person. And, and we took him, we found him a job. And we took him to his job at three in the morning. <laughs> Worked at a warehouse and said, all right, get up at three in the morning. Uh, take him to work. But you know, our house is not our house. It's the Lord's house. Amen. And, and it needed used for a purpose. Um, our car is not our car. That's the Lord's car. Our money belongs to the Lord. He just lets us steward it. He lets us take care of it, but it's the Lord's money. Our time uh, belongs to God. Our children. Yes, I just said our children. Guess what? Your children are not your own. They're just on loan from God. Amen. He lets us borrow them. In fact, Jesus... I love what Jesus said about his own followers. He called, he referred to his own disciples as his children often. He says, my children, let me tell you this, my children. And this is what he said. He said, to, he was praying and he prayed in John 17, 6. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Jesus understood. He, God the Father was just letting him borrow these disciples. They were on loan. From God and our children are alone we're we're caretakers of them uh, until they're 18 and they move out on their own whatever but they're gods and he lets them uh, let, lets us borrow them and uh, I just want to do a little we'll get on a little bit of a soapbox before we close out today um, you know me and Andrea we've dedicated our lives to full-time serving the Lord we have other people in this room that have made that same kind of dedication, like, my whole life is yours, God. I want to serve you. And you know what one of the highlights of those of us in full-time ministry is? When one of the people we're trying to train and teach decides the same thing. And they say, you know what? I want to be a missionary. I want to be a pastor. I want to be a youth pastor. I want to be a whatever, be, you know, be a church camp director or whatever it is. That is the highlight of my life. When, when one of our people we've been working with makes that decision. And, and usually it's a, it's a lot of things that were that played into that decision. And a lot of times they'll make that decision at church camp or at a CIY, a Christ in Youth or something. And, and it's like, yes, home run. They said they want to be dedicated to full-time ministry. And it's a home run to us. And you know what happens? They go home and they tell their parents, guess what? I want to be, I want to be in full-time ministry. I'm going to go to Bible college. And, and it's not just me. I've, I've had lots of other people in ministry tell me the same story. They say the parents discourage them and say, oh, you'll never make a decent living doing that. Oh, no, we are not going to pay for tuition for you to do that. You need to pick something else. What a shame. I mean, oh, talk about deflating. Just, oh, are you kidding me? What? I mean, God had them there. He had them. And then they were, you know, and. Guys, those kids aren't yours to start with. They were on loan to you from the get-go. Uh, and don't stand in the way of God. Man, don't stand in the way of God and what he is calling someone to do. Please don't do that. I, I don't typically like to read stories to you, but this one was just so powerful. Uh, I thought, I, I got to use it. I got to use it. So as we close, um, I want to read this story. Paul Stanley tells this story from his military experience. As an infantry commander, company commander in Vietnam in 1967, I saw Viet Cong soldiers surrender many times. As they were placed in custody, 
marched away and briefly interrogated, their body language and facial expressions always caught my attention. Most hung their heads in shame, staring at the ground, unwilling to look their captor in the eye. But some stood erect, staring defiantly at those around them, resisting any attempt by our men to control them. They had surrendered physically, but not mentally. On one occasion, after the enemy had withdrawn, I came upon several soldiers surrounding a wounded Viet Cong. Shot through the lower leg, he was hostile and frightened, yet helpless. He threw mud and kicked with his one good leg when anyone came near him. When I joined the circle around the wounded enemy, one soldier asked me, Sir, what do we do? He's losing blood fast and needs medical attention. I looked down at the struggling Viet Cong and saw the face of a 16 or 17 year old boy. I unbuckled my pistol belt and hand grenades so he couldn't grab them. Then, speaking gently, I moved towards him. He stared fearfully at me as I knelt down, but he allowed me to slide my arm under him and pick him up. As I walked with him toward a waiting helicopter, he began to cry and hold me tight. He kept looking at me and squeezing me tighter. We climbed into the helicopter and took off. During the ride, our young captive sat on the floor, clinging to my leg. Never having ridden in a helicopter, he looked out with panic as we gained altitude and flew over the trees. He fixed his eyes back on me, and I smiled reassuringly and put my hand on his shoulder. After landing, I picked him up and walked toward the medical tent. As we crossed the field, I felt the tenseness leave his body and his tight grasp loosen. His eyes softened and his head leaned against my chest. The fear and resistance were gone. He had finally surrendered. That's the way it is when we surrender to God, isn't it? At first we see God as the enemy and we fight him, claiming our own territory and the right to our own lives. But in our woundedness, we finally see that we cannot conquer him and the God to whom we surrender is not our enemy. He cares for us and heals us as he takes us captive. Isn't that cool?